Martin Luther King weekend, it is good to take time to remember. To remember that it is a narrow door, a narrow gate that leads to new life. In fact, that gate may be so narrow that the only way that it is possible for us to squeeze through that gate is if we are slathered with the holy oil of God's grace. How to be anointed with that holy oil of God's grace. That is what the sermon is about this morning. Unfortunately, as you know, as we can see in the news, there are times in our lives when evil, when the way of destruction and death, they knock on our door. There are times that that happens in our personal lives. There are times when it happens in our public life. For Jesus, it came knocking in the Garden of Gethsemane when the guards came to arrest Jesus for his crucifixion. It came knocking in the segregated south when the brave marched from Selma towards freedom. It came knocking at the office doors for those that were working at the magazine Charlie Hebdo a few weeks ago. When it comes knocking at our door, how will we respond? In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus' disciples responded to that knock with anger and with violence. One of his disciples quickly drew his sword and cut off an ear of one of the members that had come to arrest Jesus. But Jesus rejected the way of violence. Lay down your sword, he commanded. And then he proceeded to heal the very ear of the man who bound his hands. It was a culmination of a creative, nonviolent resistance, one that Jesus had long taught and lived. For example, Jesus' advice that we read this morning to turn the other cheek. We've heard that phrase so often that it has lost its meaning. It has lost its original, radical meaning. Instead, it has come to mean something more comfortable, perhaps a little too comfortable, something akin to just turn a blind eye. But that's not what Jesus advises. In the time of Jesus, it was permissible for a householder to strike a slave or someone in his employ with the back of his hand as a reprimand. In fact, Unfortunately, it was common. But what was not permissible was for the householder to strike them with a fist. That made them liable to arrest. When someone strikes you on the right cheek, Scripture is very specific. The right cheek. The way that one does that is with an offensive yes, but legal at the time, backhanded blow. If you're right-handed, which most people are, that is a legal backhanded blow. But Jesus' instruction to turn the other cheek, to offer up as a sacrifice, not the right cheek, but the left cheek, is a gesture of defiance. It begs the abuser, treat me as an equal. And if the abuser in their anger strikes indeed that left cheek, not with a backhanded blow, but with a right-handed fist, then the slave has the legal authority to have the householder arrested. The slave 
then would have turned the tables of power against his abuser. That is what turn the other cheek means. The same dynamic is at play in the advice that Jesus gives to go the extra mile. Often we hear that in terms of just give a little more effort. That is not what Jesus meant. It was permissible and common by law for Roman soldiers to force others, passers-by, to carry their pack because it was a heavy pack. They could force anybody to do that one mile and no more. So soldier then, after that mile, had to find somebody else to carry their pack. So if one goes the extra mile, two miles, it places a burden on the soldier. The soldier begins to get defensive, is liable now to arrest, unless he begs the person to put down my back. It alters the relationship of power between the two. Each of these teachings of Jesus is a form of creative, non-violent resistance. But for these acts to be effective in creating that power change, two things must happen. The first is that they must be witnessed by others. Or the wrongdoer will feel no pressure, will fear no repercussion for their acts if nobody sees it. Nonviolent resistance to be effective must be a public act. There is no moral high ground in accepting abuse in private. The second requirement for that resistance to be effective is that the resistor must be seen as innocent. As innocent. And that's the hard part. If the situation devolves somehow into physical or verbal altercations and abuse, it will always be blamed on the powerless. Therefore, it is essential that the resistance of the nonviolent resistor is turned inward, that the resistance they need to muster is their own internal sense of anger. They must resist that. They must resist their own desire to lash out. They must meet hate with love. They must meet violence with sacrifice, as Jesus did. For only then, only then does something miraculous and powerful happen. Only then will their sacrifice create gain. Only then will it create new life and new reality. Because only then does it activate the Holy Spirit. Does it unleash that untapped spiritual potential which lives within all of our hearts and souls. Only then does it free that from the masses and begin to create a unity of spirit among the people and a unity of purpose. Only then does it have the power to form diverse partnerships which are necessary to create positive change. But trusting the spiritual process to do that as you suffer that is enormously difficult. Loving one's enemies, praying for those who persecute us, forgiving those who crucify us as Jesus did and as Jesus teaches us to do. It's a hard pill to swallow. It is an extremely narrow gate. And few have the spiritual strength and audacity to pass through it. On the other hand, the gate that leads to retaliation and revenge, the gate that leads to righteous anger, well, that gate is wide. 
And it's unlocked, always. The gate that leads to hatred is vast. It even lies on a downhill plane, making it even easier to travel. The gate into a never-ending downward spiral where an eye is taken for an eye, is taken for an eye, is taken for an eye. That gate is so wide you can't even see the other side. The narrow gate, the one for which Jesus calls us, requires a heart that is stronger than hate. It requires a love which is stronger than the desire to destroy one's enemies, but instead desires to heal them. To squeeze through that narrow gate, it requires the grace of God's grace. And it requires training. And that is what the insert in your bulletin is all about. On the other side of the February schedule, the leaders of the sit-in movement to desegregate lunch counters in the South, they needed volunteers to go in and to sit in. And many were eager to do so. Many were eager to do so until the training came. The training that the leaders would then allow you to participate was a grueling regiment of name calling, of cigarette smoke breathed into your face over and over again. They would tap ashes from their cigarettes into your hair. They would throw hot coffee on you. And only those with the spiritual fortitude and strength, with a love greater than hate and a desire not to destroy but heal, only those were chosen. Those that got angry, those that became agitated, those that retaliated, they flunked the training. They were not used. As the Gospel says in Matthew, many are called, but few are chosen. The leaders of the sit-in movement, they were wise, for they knew whether it's right, or whether it's wrong, whether it should be or shouldn't be, that it is only the cries of the innocent that echo in the human soul and have the power to change the human heart. The cries, the angry cries of the righteous, no matter how loud they get, the cries of those that become entangled in violence, no matter how justifiable those cries, they fall on deaf ears. They garner no support. They lack power. Jesus' sacred way of sacrifice and nonviolent resistance, it had power. And it had power Precisely because when he was spat on, and when he was taunted, and when he was whipped and nailed to the cross, he met that injustice, that violence of word and deed, with the heart still miraculously full of love and compassion. Jesus said to them, Oh God, forgive them. Evil tried to recruit Jesus to its side. Evil tried to reshape Jesus' heart into hatred. It tried to goad him into violence. But it could not. And because it could not, because others witnessed it, what arose from that sacrifice of Jesus, his way of love, was new life, powerfully. Globally, his conquering evil in his own heart, it unleashed a frenzy of Holy Spirit that blows still today, that inspires still today, which emboldens even today. The timid with courage, 